This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at where did the road go? Dot com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? I'm here with Ren Collier. Hello, hey, Ren. And David McCallum. Hi, David. Hello. Hello and you're, there. you're over in Scotland. Yep. And uh, you are the, the person who had uh, sent me some, st- two years ago, sent me some really interesting high strangeness stories that we talked about on the show. And uh, a lot of people wanted to know more and wanted you to come on. And we finally talked you into it. Yep. <laughs> Peer pressure <laughs> always works. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad I came on too. Definitely. So do you still have weird experiences now or were most of them cir- cycled around the, the house you lived in? Oh, I still live in the same house. To be oh, honest, okay. recently, not so much. It seems to have uh, died down as it often does, you know, in the last, say, maybe the last year. There's been the odd things, you know, just maybe hearing a noise or something, but nothing in the level of what happened before. I'm not sure why that is. These hmm. things just uh, come and go and be a willy their own, you know? Yeah. So what, what, what are the earliest weird experiences you remember? Well, I think the... The story I told about being in the tent in the hallway, when we seen what looked like my dad sitting in the chair, that's one of the earliest ones. I have another, but I'm not sure how real it is. Mm. I can go over that if you want. Sure, sure. Okay, so one of my... I used to share a room downstairs with two of my sisters. This was before the, the youngest was born. And I must have only been about 10 or something at the time. And this is one of the, the sort of earliest memories I can think of. And basically, the layout of the room was... There's a set of bunk beds along one end of the wall, and then opposite the other wall, there was a single bed. So I slept in the top bunk, and my sister's in the bottom bunk, and that other single bed. And between the two beds, there was a window. So one night, I'm lying in bed sleeping, and something disturbs me, wakes me up, and I peek out from under the covers. And what I seen was three grey aliens, and they just sort of walked through the window, sort of walking in a triangle formation, so like, one in front and then two in the back, sort of like a V formation. Mm-hmm. And they, they, well, they walked through the window like that and they were all sort of bathed in light. They walked into the room and they walked over to my, my youngest sister that was sleeping in the single bed and they just sort of stood there looking at her. So I was sort of peeking out from my bed, you know, in the top bunk and one of them turned around and sort of looked me right in the eyes. And being a kid at that age, all I could do was sort of start crying and put my head back under the covers and that's the last I remember of that so there's not much else to say about it really I just I don't know if it's a dream or if it was something it was that long ago you know right did, did your sister remember anything from that no not, the, the other my other two sisters don't remember any of that experience although as I've said before we have circumstances like when me and my sister saw the thing in the when we were in the tent and that so we've seen stuff together before but they don't remember any of that. Hmm. Okay. The number uh, three there is interesting to me because... I've heard, I've heard that a lot. Like, they always come in threes, like shadow people, and three uh-huh. seems to be... It seems yeah. to mean something, you know? Yeah, it even ties into, uh, you know, Al Bender's, the, the three men in black that we yeah. saw. And, yeah, and, and even... Um, I was mentioning before the show this, uh, you know, cipher I was working on... Um, Tim Renner had put in a value that he had heard during one of his experiences and the value, one of the values he got back were we are three. Yeah. Three. So, <laughs> uh, so and it's, then there's it's, the aspect yeah. like the Holy Trinity and three through yeah. mythology. And it's, it's un- I don't know what it all means, but it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's certainly hard to parse out what, what the significance of three would be, but you often see these entities appear in groups of three. Um, I was even thinking about, uh, a report that uh, Tim had on his show where this, this guy had looked out his window and saw these three entities walking in single file line. Um, oh, you yeah. see three all over the place. It's, it's really odd. Cause it's like, why, why three? Like, and, and like you mentioned, you know, you have the Holy Trinity and you have 
the number three repeated throughout esoteric systems and religions and everything. It's, it's, it's a very, very odd. People are drawn to that number. You know, a celebrity yeah. guy, some people will say, well, there's always three. And even though there yes. isn't, they kind of pin down the three yeah, that happens. Yeah, comes in threes. That's a saying. Yeah. 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 They even have the, uh, the black triangle UFOs. I mean, it's a triangle. It's got three sides. Yeah. True. And these things <laughs> were walking in a triangle formation. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it's weird. Yeah. And, 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 the only other thing I can say about that experience is, I don't mm-hmm. know if it's related, but I've always had this fear of greys for some reason, like, mm. even seeing, like, a, a 40 one or that, or, like, <laughs> the, I've got communion in my cupboard, like, and uh-huh. it's buried under a stack of other books, and I look at that cover and just, no, 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 <laughs> yeah. that's bad. <laughs> like, that's, a, that's a common reaction. <laughs> yeah, I do yeah. the exact same thing. Like, if I ever have communion or like any of the sequels, out, I always turn the cover over so I don't yeah, have to like just, look at well, it. I have that book out; it, it never sits with the cover up. Like that's <laughs> always something down. No, it's just it's like they can watch you through the cover. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally feel you on that. I do the same exact thing. And when you when you saw these entities, did you get the sense that I mean, you said they walked the wall. So did you get the sense that they were like not really physically there or like physical, but more sort of? Not- well, as I said, I was like ten years old or something at the mm-hmm. time. I, I really they seemed physical to me at the time. You know, I was a kid. Mm-hmm. They seemed mm-hmm. like they were really there. I didn't have anything that would imply that they weren't. You know. Hmm. I, I think a lot about. Um, a lot of the experiences, especially the the experiences Whitley Strieber describes in Transformation, um, he expresses having these gray, you know, these visitor contacts in and out of body state, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so he's he's fully out of body, and even um, um, is it Mike McClellan? Mike Cleland. Mike Cleland yeah, has Mike, mentioned, Mike Cleland, um, yeah, yeah, that he he thinks that when he's had some of his experiences, he's never actually physically left his bed. See that said. Sent- Sorry to uh, cut you off there. Like Go speaking ahead. of some of my other things, like when I, like the story I told before, like when I woke up in that place with the runes and that, like I would say I was definitely out of body for that. I mean, I don't think mm-hmm. I was ever physically taken out of my bed or anything. Although mm-hmm. it felt like it. I mean, it, it wasn't like a dream. What I'm saying is, it felt like it was really there, but mm-hmm. I don't think I was in any kind of physical capacity. You know, mm-hmm. how how old were you when that happened? The the thing with the. Uh, the runes and that? Yeah, yeah. That wasn't too long ago. That was yeah, like when I posted about 2015 into 2016, New Year's. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was only like, what, that would be three, four years ago now. Okay, all right. So so, so you weren't a little kid when that happened? No, no, no. I was a, an adult. And, Brand, if I remember, you had questions about it. You actually, uh, David, you actually posted to our Reddit uh, some drawings of the runes you saw. Yeah, I did. I can only really remember one of them clearly. As, as you said, it's on the Reddit if any of the listeners want to take a look. I've tried like looking up runic alphabets and stuff before, and mm-hmm. I found one that was kind of close, but doesn't really match either. The one I found was it means property or home. So maybe I woke up in my other house or something, I don't know. But, <laughs> but at, at the same time, it didn't really look like that rune at all, so I can't really say. Yeah, that's 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 the only one day what I saw that really stuck in my mind because it was the uh, the closest to me. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'll check out the Reddit and, and look at that image a little later and try to see if I can if I can come up with it. Oh yeah, if, if any have any idea what it means, feel free to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll look at it. Uh, um, wasn't it was it Bud Hopkins that had the big list of like different sort of alien symbols that yes, people had I seen? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I always thought that was really fascinating because, uh, I mean, I, I guess I draw a comparison to, like, spirit sigils. You know, like in like in the Goetia, all the different mm. demons of the Goetia have like a different yeah. sort of sigil, right? And I've always wondered, like, where where did people get those sigils? Like, how were they originally created? Because in some cases, like with angelic sigils, it's obvious that they were made with a kamiya or like a magic square. Um, but in some of the cases, especially like goetic sigils. Um, they're sometimes very strange uh, and like obviously not created using any kind of like magic square or Kamiya system. And I, I know in a, in a couple of experiences I've had, uh, it, one in particular, I, I met a spirit in a dream and it showed me its symbol. And I've always wondered if if those 
type of experiences in which you're shown symbols like that in a dream aren't meant to be sort of represent like a representation of whatever entity was trying to communicate with you and mm-hmm. sort of like a symbolic level. Well, that makes sense to me. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. these things would communicate on a symbolic level. So yeah. Yeah. And specifically something like, like a sigil that may not actually have any sort of meaning in any language uh, uh, like we would understand well, it that, that's what was mm-hmm. going to say like when these things are communicating chant they might not even understand our concept of speaking language or written language you know if they're coming mm-hmm. from some other completely different place you know mm-hmm. yeah it's more like they're speaking in the language of like metaphors and, and semiotics than mm-hmm. any sort of spoken or written language mm. um and and if I remember right, t- t- go over that experience for people who may not have heard the the original one. Okay, well, yeah. it was what we call Hogmanay Night in Scotland. It's New Year's Night, traditionally a time for heavy drinking, you know. So that night I was I hadn't actually drunk that much. I think I'd only had a token drink just for tradition's sake. And I'd went to bed fairly early, so I was lying in bed sleeping, and all of a sudden I could hear this noise and. It, to sort of say it, it was like a sort of boom, boom, boom. And it, the, the thing that came into my head was like a warp sound, be like Star Trek or something, you know, that kind of engine sound. Mm-hmm. And I leave my computer on at night, so I thought, you know, a YouTube video or something must have started playing, you know. I better wake up and switch it off. So I just sort of jumped out of bed to turn my computer off. And when I jumped out of bed, I was in a completely different room. <laughs> I wasn't in the wasn't in my house anymore. I was lying in a completely different bed. It was, to describe the room, it was almost pitch black. Like, the walls were like a black obsidian colour. I couldn't mm. really see too far. It was only illuminated by the runes and the walls, and those were sort of glowing with like a faint yellow glow. So I really couldn't see far into the room. I don't know if there was anything else in the room with me, because I couldn't see far into the blackness. And I was sort of positioned in an alcove with like these sort of silky, weird metallic sheets over me, like really thin, shiny, just weird. And I was sitting like that for a while, just sort of taking in my surroundings, and then I felt this, what I can only describe as an overwhelming sort of force come over me, like another presence, just sort of, it's hard to describe with words, like try to push my consciousness away. Like, it mm-hmm. wasn't so much as a physical push, more like a mental thing. Like, I could feel it pushing my mind somewhere. And I tried to fight back against it. You know, I remember sort of swearing a lot in my head. And a, a weird sort of thought popped up, like, not again, as if I'd experienced this before. But I, I can't rem- I can't really say that I have or not. But at the time, I thought, not again, not again, not again. And I kept trying to push back and push back against whatever it was. And eventually, it won over. I mean, it did. It was just like this, almost like an electrical snap, but I sort of, I felt like I landed back in my bed and I felt disoriented and just all out of whack, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, you know, and there, there's things in there that, that are familiar to me, like that, that being pu- mentally sort of pushed. I've had it in, uh, sleep paralysis experiences and other stuff like that. Um, I also had it once. Um, I had a, I had a girlfriend who had dissociative disorder, and I was trying to understand it, trying to understand how you can be, you know, different people and not and and see but not have control of what's going on, and all this. And I was driving at the time, and suddenly I felt my consciousness get pushed into the background and something else take over for a moment. And then I and I you know mildly panicked, although the car was driving fine. But I realized that's the exact situation i was in and then suddenly it just released me and i was back to normal and i was like okay i understand don't do that again please you know <laughs> yeah that's weird i mean i suppose you could say it was like you know, it's like riding a bike once you're that good at driving a car you're you can almost do it without thinking although you should never you never should drive without thinking but right most people yes. do uh, yeah i think once you get used to it to a certain extent you know it becomes second nature yeah yeah, the robot takes over. Yeah. So did you get the impression when you were in that place that you were trespassing or that something had noticed well, you and it, was trying to kick you out? 
Yeah, that's the kind of feeling I got, especially what happened after. You know, as we said mm-hmm. in the last show, after that happened, I sort of stayed up for a few hours. I was naturally quite sort of mm-hmm. disturbed. I didn't want to go right back to sleep, so I sort of filled in my diary. As I said, I keep a diary in this kind of stuff now. Mm-hmm. So I filled that in and I had a cup of tea and sat about for a few hours till around till about 5am and then I thought, yeah, it's probably safe to get back to bed. And then when I did go back to bed, well, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Mm-hmm. As, I, as we said in the last show, it was just like Groundhog Day. Like You've heard the term of false awakening, you know, when you, you wake mm-hmm. up but you haven't really woken up. Mm-hmm. And I was yeah. just like getting constantly attacked by something, waking up, getting attacked again, waking up, and it just seemed to go on forever, you know. Then eventually I did wake up, and when I did, like, you know, I was destroyed. I mean, I felt like I'd been hit with a bus, like... Mm-hmm. My whole body was in agony. I could hardly move. I felt terrible, and it was like that for like a few days. Yeah, and it's that's... like it took a lot out of you. Yeah, and that, and especially after that sort of assault, I got the impression that what was attacking me was the same thing that had pushed me out before. Again, nothing. I never saw mm-hmm. an entity. Nothing tried to communicate with me as direct as that. But that's the impression mm-hmm. I got. Did you have any physical marks after that on your body over the next couple of days, or was it just a general exhaustion? I don't really remember. I don't think mm-hmm. so. If it did, it would have been really minor. But I, I didn't mm-hmm. write down in my diary like I was covered in scratches or anything like you hear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was more of just like extreme fatigue and muscle ache, you know? Mm-hmm. It's really interesting because in like experiences I've had, um, I've had things try to keep me places or pull... Like I, in one out of body experience, I was pulled away from the place I was at and, and sort of trapped in a so place that I couldn't leave. Yeah, until I like you know confronted the thing that was trapping me there. Um, but I've never had anything like push me out. Um, so that's that's really fascinating. It almost feels like you uh, you accidentally ended up somewhere that you weren't supposed to be. You know, you were. Yeah, that's that, that's kind of the impression I got. Like mm-hmm. the way I look at it now is it was an accidental astral projection. And where mm-hmm. I projected myself, the the guy that lives there wasn't too chuffed about it, so mm-hmm. <laughs> he chucked me out and then decided to beat me up after it. <laughs> I, I think what really interested me about your uh, where you went too was that it sort of reminded me. Um, have you ever seen uh, Hellraiser? Specifically, yeah. the second Hellraiser movie. No, I haven't. So there's this scene in in Hell uh, where there's sort of all of these. Um, uh, like like tombs uh, there's a word for this like it's not ossuary but you know how like in sort of like old tombs there sort of be these uh indentions in the wall in which mm-hmm. you know a casket is placed yeah yeah that, that's kind of yeah that i get that that's sort of where i was it was like an alcove built into the wall uh-huh. and i was lying in the alcove with like this thin sheet over me a mausoleum a mausoleum yeah, yeah. like a mausoleum yeah that because the, the sheet almost reminds me of like a burial shroud or something that had been placed over you and it, it really makes me think about um, all the sort of indications and hints in Whitley Strieber's work that these visitors have something to do with the afterlife. Because he has these experiences where he goes to a place that's, that's sort of similar in, in, in a way in which he sees all of these like basically bodies that are empty, like they, they're not in sold and they're all sort of like hanging out. Uh, with the, you know, it never comes out and says it explicitly, but I think the implication there is that uh, these are bodies that are ready to be like incarnated in the, you know, in the human world. Mm-hmm. And that he's sort of shown that whatever these things are, they have something to do with the cycle of death and rebirth. And, and in your story, it's almost like you, you ended up in the same place, but they were like, ah, oh, he's not ready to see this, or he's not ready to parse this information. And, and we got to get him out of here. <laughs> you know, David, you aren't supposed to be here for another 20 years. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> And it also, and I think I said this when we read the story, that it reminds me of what Jeff Ritzman went through when he was when he was young, where he would fall asleep and find himself somewhere else. Uh, he would see that that square that would uh, take yeah. up everything, and then like he would also have like a, a sheet on him of some very strange yeah. material. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but didn't he like wake up in a field and he had that sheet over him or something? 
I don't think it was a field. I think it was, a, God, I don't remember exactly. I think it was like a, uh, some kind of operating room or something. Yeah, I think he said he felt like he was on a table and all yeah. these things were around him and they were like holding down the sheet so he couldn't like get it off of him. Like they were, they're holding it down over him. I may be quoting him incorrectly here, but that's what I remember. It's been a couple of years since he, since I had him on about mm-hmm. it, so I don't remember it. Yeah, I might be verbatim. getting confused with one of these other stories. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think he ended up in a field. I think he was he was in some place like similar to what you described in a way. Mm-hmm. And, I think uh, I'm thinking the time he saw a UFO when they were driving or something, and they stopped the car and they sort of went out into a field to investigate, and some mm. weird stuff happened. Oh yeah, yeah, where he saw the UFO rise up over the trees, and he yeah. ran back to the car. Yeah. And- then he had sort of missing time after yeah, that. Yeah, it was the missing time stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I was under the impression sort of during that whole thing mm-hmm. a sheet was involved somewhere, but I could be wrong. No, I don't think so. So no. so in your um when you were talking about how you had the false awakenings, mm-hmm. um, that was after you went back to sleep. Yes. After you had the experience, right? So like you so it wasn't that you were well, I mean, I guess you wrote in your diary, so and I assume that that entry is still there. So you were physically awake when you wrote down the entry and then you went back to bed. Yep. And then you had all those series of false awakenings. Yep. That's correct. In those false awakenings, um, did you have the sense each time like that you didn't know that you were still asleep or did you realize that you were still in a dream? I, I, I was some after like the first time it happened, I think I was somewhat mm-hmm. aware of what was going on. Mm-hmm. And it, after a few more times, I was like fully sure, you know, this, this <laughs> yeah, is some yeah. kind of dream cycle, but I had no idea how to escape it, you know, and yeah. basically I'd just keep getting battered and battered, and then I'd wake up again and think, oh, relief at last, and then I'd start getting battered again, and <laughs> it just never seemed to end. Yeah, it was, um, like I mentioned on the show, I'd, I'd, I'd have a similar experience after having and a huge out-of-body experience myself, and where it was almost like each time I would end up in another dream that I would accept as reality for a little bit. And then I would be like, Oh wait, this, yeah, this isn't that's... real. I'm dreaming again. Crap. And then like, okay, I'm going to wake up. And then I would go right back into another dream. And it, it feels, it's so frustrating when it happens. Cause it really does feel like you're trapped. I mean, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, people always tell you, you know, if you're, if you're having a bad dream, just, you know, wake yourself up. And it's like, sometimes that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've definitely been in that trap before. Yeah, it's an awful feeling. <laughs> the only reason I knew I had to woke up is because that time I woke up, my body was done. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was just done. I could feel it. Yeah, and then, and that you know, and the the other time where I felt like my consciousness was being one of the other times I felt my consciousness being pushed around was the time I got slapped around by something. Yeah, but I, but but I wasn't waking up repeatedly. I just found my I found myself in a field, you know, surrounded mm-hmm. by by things in this darkness that just kept slamming into me and slamming me into the ground. Yeah, I, th- I think you said before it was like a hazing ritual almost. You know, it was like they were yeah, testing you. Yeah, it could have been. See, I, I've never fully decided on what I think happened there. You know, it's like the, it's it's always left me a little puzzled, but it sort of woke me up, and mm-hmm. that. That followed a whole bunch of other, you know, that followed with a whole bunch of other good experiences, including them giving me my name. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was something. I don't, I don't know if I was supposed to stay down or keep getting up, but I kept getting up, and eventually I got pulled out of there and snapped back into my body to a point where I almost bounced off the bed. Yeah, and I get- and and I had bruises, not not severe ones, but I had bruises, and I was hurting for about a week. Yeah, it's definitely similar. As I said, I, I don't know if it was bruised or not. All I know is I never wrote that down in the diary. And I think I think if I had notable bruises or scratches or anything, it would have been something I wrote down. But all, all I wrote down was like the, the fatigue and the pain in my muscles, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, which indicates something happened. Mm-hmm. Doesn't tell us what, though. Yeah, it very rarely does. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, so l- l- let's look at some of the other experiences. I know you sent me a couple of, like three or four that you had uh, that you, we haven't talked about yet. Let's talk about some of those. Well, if um, we're on the topic of, sort of astral projecting, lucid dreaming, I could get into a few of those if you'd like. Yeah, definitely. Well, the, one of the first stories I sent you recently was the, I used to work in building sites and it involved a lot of traveling around, you know, with, could work for one end of the country or the other day by day. So we'd left 
early one morning and we actually arrived on site about an hour before we had to start. So we all decided to get a sleep in the van. So I was sleeping. And, well, <laughs> I was sleeping, but I wasn't. For me, I, I couldn't get to sleep. So I decided, right, I'm just going to jump out the van and go for a walk. And I started to walk down the street. And when I rounded the corner, that's when I realised that there was nothing there. Like, the way I described it, it's like the street hadn't finished loading yet. It was just this big, fast, blank, white void of nothingness as far as I could see. And I'm like, ha ha, though, that's not supposed to be there. I mean, I know this is a building site and we build houses and stuff, but, I mean, the ground isn't even there. <laughs> hmm. So I, wa- I walked into the void and eventually I came across, like, a lake shore, a water lap up, and at the shore there was an arrowhead, and I bent down, picked it up, and that's when I woke back up in the van. So, not sure what that was, whether, again, if it was some kind of accidental lucid dream or astral projection. Right, it, it, I think there's an episode of the, of the Twilight Zone that's similar to that, too. Where people, where the people were uh, walking ahead, and they'd find like parts of reality that hadn't been made yet. Yeah, that's. I've never seen that episode, but that's the way I describe it. It was like I was walking down the street, Saraya, and there was nothing there to like tell me that I was dreaming. Otherwise, it just seemed perfectly normal. And I walked for like a good five, ten minutes, rounded the corner, and that's <laughs> when I realised there was something wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it also makes me think of uh, Jim Elvich's idea that reality only makes what it needs to make at any given time. Yeah, almost like. Again, getting getting back to like game descriptions, like it's only loading in the stuff that the player's going to be seeing, and it doesn't bother loading stuff that you can't see to save memory. You know, right, mm-hmm. right, exactly. Yeah, like when you're in a, especially like in three D environments, it doesn't render like the backside of things, yeah. right? So, uh, because you're never going to see it, so there's no point to it unless you you know drop out of bounds for some reason, yeah. and then and you, now can you can see it, see all the chaos. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's super interesting because I'm normally not like a big like reality is a simulation kind of guy because I, I think that's uh, it, it's a neat metaphor, but it's probably a little too simplistic. If but, it's a simulation, it's not in the way most people think it is. I yeah, don't think exactly. there's a computer somewhere running planet Earth, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's, I don't know, your story is very much like, like you said, it's like, like a game, like it just hasn't loaded the assets yet. Did it seem like uh, so? When you say it was like empty, um, I mean, did you just see like gray or like how just, how would you describe it? The sky was pure white. The ground was pure white. There was no distinction between the sky and the ground. Like I couldn't see a horizon line or anything. Mm-hmm. And I just sort of walked into it and I was walking on something that I, it was just like pure white. And at the further and further I walked into it, eventually I could see something on the horizon. And mm-hmm. as I get close to it, that was like the shore of this lake. And again, the, the water. It was like lapping up on the white ground with a perfect white sky above. There was mm. really little standing out. Wow. Mm. It almost, it kind of reminds me of um, the way people describe some, like, almost like religious experiences, right? Like being surrounded by limitless light. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, or Einsof, you know, like this idea that that's, that's like a manifestation of the divine. Or like sometimes contact experiences are like predicated by that sort of experience. So look- the- oh, sorry, okay. keep going. No, go ahead. Go ahead. That's all. I was just going to say I'd looked up like dream meetings and metaphor mm-hmm. and the arrowhead as well. And apparently, finding an arrowhead in your dream means like destiny or something. You know. Hmm. But what that means, I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Anything that, else happen around that time? See, so try to think back. At, at that particular point, I don't think I'd started my diary yet. So if anything was, I didn't write it down, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the, the whole time working the building, uh, the building sites, it wasn't the best experience. Let's just say it, it wasn't the job for me, although I'd done it for seven years. Mm. So I, do, I don't know what was happening outside of the paranormal stuff then. It might have, you know, you hear that, you know, like stuff going on in your life. Can trigger these things but as i said i don't know i never had the diary at that point so yeah yeah you're, you're not necessarily going to remember the stuff around it yeah hmm um all right so let's, let's move on to one of these other ones here um and i just move the thing where it goes so the phone ringing one is really interesting talk, talk well, about that one 
Well, talking about the what I was saying before about the when I woke up with the runes and that, there was some things happened after it. That whole sort of time period, the like three months, was like super high strangeness for me. Just tons of stuff seemed to happen, and at the tail end, of it was this weird phone call. So. I was unemployed at the time and I'd been applying for loads and loads and loads of jobs, you know. So I get in desperate. And I'm sitting in the living room one day with my sister and everybody else in the house is away. And I can hear this old fashioned telephone start ringing, like see the old phones with like the turn dial and the bell? Something that barely even exists anymore, that old classic phone ring. I started mm-hmm. to hear that really loud, as if it was just coming from the other room. I'm saying to my sister, like, can you hear that? She's like, what are you talking about? Are you going mental? And I'm like, I can hear something. So I went into my room and that's when I noticed my phone. I'd left it on charge and it was on silent. But there was a call coming through. And it turns out that that was the phone call of my current employer phoning me to let me know I'd got the job. So I might have missed that phone call if it wasn't for that weird ringing I heard. Hmm. So, that, uh, it, it, it sounds to me like you're... you're... You psychically picked up there was a phone call coming through. Yeah, or, or someone was sort of trying to warn me, like, oh, you're going to miss this phone call, son. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost uh, like yeah. you have something watching out for you. But whatever it was, yeah, definitely. That's, this is the best job I've ever had in my life, so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever tend to get, um, like, a sense of, like, that, that something is pointing things out to you or helping you in that, that sense? That's the impression I got with the phone call. I, 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 I got the impression, you know, maybe someone's looking out for me, you know? I mean, that was only like a few weeks after all that stuff, we getting beaten up and that. Mm-hmm. So that was just a really weird time. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it makes me think, recently I read a book um, uh, about out-of-body experiences. I, I can't remember the name of the author off the top of my head. Um, I'll, I'll have to put it like on the Reddit or something. But one thing he mentions in it is that the more he had these out-of-body experiences, the more he felt like, A, like his sort of psychic mm-hmm. abilities were not not necessarily increasing, but he was more able to, to use them or, or having sort of more psychic experiences, more synchronicities and that sort of thing. And one particular thing is he starts to mention that he starts hearing this voice, not not like a voice in his head that's like saying words to him, but just sort of a like he would get feelings about things like mm-hmm. he would be going to park his car and he would, hear, you know, sort of get this feeling or hear this voice that would say, hey, you should park at that parking space because there's still time on that meter. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, there would still be time on that meter. And. It was always like little things like that that would try to help him out, like or it would you know tell him to you know you're oh, you're about to miss your bus or, and and he sort of took it as yeah. like sort of a manifestation of his own intuition or his own psychic yeah, or, ability, like his higher self or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, like the higher self, and and that's how I see it, you know, from an occultist perspective. Um, that's reminds me of say like the holy guardian angel or your higher mm-hmm. self, like something that is kind of watching out for you and, and protects you and, and can you can sort of converse with to gain information about the world around you. Mm-hmm. And whether or not that's an objective reality or an objective entity that is doing that or a subjective experience of your own like latent psychic abilities, I don't know. But it, it's interesting that he sort of started to develop that after he started having these out-of-body experiences. And it reminds me also, too, of people who have, like, near-death experiences and then sub- subsequently develop, mm-hmm. you know, psi abilities. Well, speaking of psi abilities, I can tell you about the, the one time I had a sort of premonition. Okay. Oh, you go for it. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but okay. <laughs> so I'd finished, I'd finished work one day, and this is where I'm working in my current job. And just got home, it was day shift, just got home, I had a quick shower, ate a quick dinner and I was sitting in my chair. And as you do sometimes after a hard shift and eating your dinner, you start to feel sleepy. But I felt a lot more sleepier than I'd normally do at like five o'clock in the day. So I sat back and I closed my eyes and almost immediately upon closing my eyes, I had the craziest vision of one of my co-workers and a good friend of mine. And all, all I can remember seeing was like, it was just sort of sitting in pure blackness. I, I didn't like, you hear about remote viewing and stuff, but I couldn't see, like, the room or anything he was in. I could just see him sitting there. And in his left hand, he was sort of balancing a, a plate of spaghetti bolognese. 
and in his right hand he was holding the fork. So he lifted his left hand up to sort of pull it up to chin height to take a bite of his food. And as he done that, the plate slipped and he spilled all the spaghetti down himself. <laughs> so I started to laugh and I, I woke up at this point and I was <laughs> laughing like crazy. like, And it was beyond <laughs> it was beyond the funniness of what I'd saw. Like, I honestly thought I was going delirious because I, I couldn't stop laughing. And I was saying to myself, like, Jesus, David, you're going crazy, mate. You're, you're imagining crazy <laughs> stuff like this. Now you can't stop yourself laughing. What's wrong with you? You know, I, I could not stop laughing for like a good five minutes and eventually I calmed down and sort of didn't think too much else of it. But the next day at work, I bumped into him and I says, oh, you know, I had this weird dream about you last night. I, was, I had a nap after dinner and I dreamt that you spilt spaghetti down himself. And when <laughs> I said that, he was like, whoa, what? I happened. He did. He, was, <laughs> he, he finished his work and he, he ate dinner just about after I did and Turns out he really did spill all his spaghetti down himself, so... <laughs> and the, the guys at work sort of joked for like a week or so after that that it was psychic or something, but that's the only time it's ever happened, and it was for something so completely useless, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, what I love about it. It's like, so many times these premonitions are so totally pointless. It's like, well, why why would you see that? Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, show me something useful. If, I, if I've got superpowers, show me something useful. Why show me my pal spilling spaghetti down himself? Yeah, well, really. Clearly you needed a laugh. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> what? So wh- why don't you, you get into to telling us about the doppelganger experiences again uh, for anyone who misses them? Because yeah, they were definitely was... some of the weirdest ones. Do you want me to start with the, the big tamale, the, the face? Yeah, yeah. Because that also ties into something you wrote me. Uh, that we haven't talked about yet with yeah. your psychedelic experience. Which one came first, the doppelganger? Oh, definitely the doppelganger. Okay, so, a, so talk a, about that first. Okay, I, so I talk wasn't about taking that psychedelics first. when I was 12. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, as I said, I, was, I must have been around 12 or 13 because I'd just started high school. And as I said in the story before, my sister had came home like a half hour before me because primary school finishes a half hour before. And she'd went into the house and saw a similar thing, and but she hadn't interacted with it the same way I had. She'd just sort of left and went back out in the garden. Uh, sorry, I should uh, I should say that at the time, my whole family was out in the garden. The house was empty because it was a summer's day. It was quite nice. So I finished finished school and I'm walking up to the house. And the way it is, the driveway sort of goes up, and you can see the garden for the street, the back garden, and I could see that everybody was back there. So I thought, right, I'm just going to go in and sort of chuck my school bag and quickly changed my clothes and joined them in the garden. So I went up into the house, went into the living room, and that's when I saw my very youngest sister, who, again, she was only like one or two years old at the time. And she was in the house alone, which right away I thought, that's weird. Why would my mum and dad leave my wee sister, you know, in the house alone? That's not right at all. And she was sitting really, really close to the TV, like just a foot away from the television, sitting cross-legged, staring at it. And I should mention as well, the television wasn't on. It's not like she was watching any show or that. It was off at the time. So the whole thing was just like really, really weird. But I was concerned, you know, being her brother. So I thought, right, walk up and see what's happening here. She was just really still as well. Like, it's just so not right. So I put my hand on her shoulder and sort of turned around to get a look at her face. And I'm not sure... If, that, if that's when it happened or if she sort of turned to look at me too at that point. But the next thing I can remember is once I sort of got a look at her face. <laughs> you ever seen 2001 A Space Odyssey? Mm-hmm. You know that's that crazy trippy scene? Yeah. Yeah, similar to that. Just like never ending colours and fractal patterns and just utter chaos. Like, And it seemed, I don't know how long that went on for. At the time it felt like it was forever. Like, it had a weird timeless quality to it. It's, it is a hard thing to really say in words. Hmm. It was just really weird. And then I don't know what happened after that. That's the other weird thing. I mean, for all I know, I just went back into my room and turned the Nintendo on or something. And I really don't know. Though, hmm. And I would think, I would doubt that it was even real if it wasn't for the fact that my sister says she was in earlier and saw the same entity. Right. So that's what makes me think, right, maybe I really did see something here, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what more to say about it. It's... Did you get the impression that there was actually like missing time there? Like, what's your next 
memory from there? Like the Again, next day, happened, or it happened when I was twelve. Bear in mind, yeah. and I'm I'm thirty now, and yeah, I, I really couldn't tell you what I done the next mm. day or the next week. Or, yeah, so I, I really that. I really don't know. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit. Uh, like all the colors, were there? You said it was like chaos. Were there fractals or yeah, like just patterns? Like, just like fractals and patterns, like tie dye shirt kind of stuff, and mm. just infinite colors, constantly fluctuating. Nothing ever stood still. Constantly fluctuating, just mm. and it, it completely consumed my mind. Like I couldn't think of anything else. I couldn't. I could see. I couldn't even think about the colors. I could see them and I could remember them, but like. Mm-hmm. It's a hard thing to really describe. It reminds me of the way people describe sort of the fractal vision that they get when uh, during like a DMT experience. Oh yeah, that's or ayahuasca. Could, that's something I could get into because as Saraya just mentioned, I did have yeah. one psychedelic experience, and that's the mm-hmm. closest I've ever really got to experiencing anything similar to that. Mm-hmm. And it was when I was in my early twenties, and I bought this dubious legal high online. <laughs> the only reason it was a legal high is because some guy had probably just made it up in his shed and there was no laws about it yet, you know? Mm-hmm. It wasn't exactly eBay I bought this off either. It was some dodgy little site. I don't even know why I done it, you know. Back, <laughs> in yeah. hindsight, you know. But mm-hmm. I did. I did. So this stuff came and, you know, put a wee bit in my pipe and smoked it and I thought, I've wasted my money on a load of nonsense, haven't I? <laughs> So I thought, do you know what? Maybe if I smoke it all at once, I'll get a little buzz off it. <laughs> so, so I just I fired the oil in my pipe, you know, the whole shebang, and just puffed mm-hmm. it all at once. And I sat down in my chair and I was like, I've wasted my money. Nothing's, nothing's happening. Mm-hmm. I was disappointed, you know. <laughs> and then about two seconds later, same again, 2001 A Space Odyssey. <laughs> just, I was sitting in my computer chair and next minute I was somewhere else. It was... I wasn't even me anymore. I mean, you hear like eagle death and stuff. Mm-hmm. But when I'm having these experiences, that's what it's like. It's like I'm not even myself anymore when I'm experiencing this. Mm-hmm. I can see the colours and I am the colours and there's mm-hmm. no such thing as time. Like mm-hmm. when, I, when I took the psychedelic, I estimate I must have only been unconscious for a half hour, maybe an hour. But at mm-hmm. the time when I was experiencing that, it honestly felt like I was there forever. Like I'd always been there. Again, it's so hard to put it into words, but it, it was this. I wouldn't. I'm not sure if it was exactly the same, but it was definitely mm-hmm. very similar to what I experienced before. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I had the, the drug had another effect on me that was really weird. I had a, a strange kind of amnesia, but like, mm-hmm. yeah, I only knew something existed if I could see it, and the minute it left my sight again, I would forget it again. So like. I woke up back in my computer chair and the first thing I seen, this was back in the days of like MSN Messenger and stuff, mm-hmm. and it was an MSN window open. And I honestly, I'm not even joking, I honestly thought that that was the whole world like that. Ch- I didn't even know I was in a room, like, try <laughs> to explain it. And mm-hmm. I'm typing like, what's happening, what's happening? And my pals mm-hmm. are going, Jesus, Stevie, what have you done to your cell now? <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's the last thing you want to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> things to do, yeah. So... I, gradually I sort of looked around a bit more and I realised I was sitting in a room and mm-hmm. honestly it blew my mind at the time I, I couldn't even believe I was in a three dimensional space, like that's how mm-hmm. bad this kind of weird amnesia was whatever mm-hmm. it was I was experiencing, I was like what is this place? I was looking around my room like whoa touching the walls and stuff like yeah. is this real you know and I saw my bed at the far side of the room and I thought right I'm going to go over there so I went onto the floor, I started to drag myself over to my bed with my arms and this is the honest to God reason I was dragging myself across the floor I hadn't looked down and I honestly honestly didn't know I had legs <laughs> like I'd honestly <laughs> forgotten that I had legs mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm like crawling across the floor dragging myself with the arms you know dragging mm-hmm. the weight of my legs behind me because at that time I didn't know I had legs yet until I, later on I looked down and I'm like oh what are these things, they, these will come in handy <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. And like, when I was sitting in the bed, I could hear this music, you know, this bam, 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 bam. And I'm like, oh, where is this music coming from? Where is this coming from? And I realised it was my heart beating. Oh, and yeah. at, that point, at that point, I thought, I'm going to die. This is it. This is how I die. 
I've, yeah. I've done a stupid thing. I'm going to die. And at that point, I sort of started to slip back into the, the psychedelic, you know? I'd mm-hmm. shut my eyes and I start getting waves of like colours again. And I'm like, oh, I need to fight this because I'm going to die. I mean, I've, I've heard people like dying for like legal highs before. And I can honestly, I can honestly believe it because I thought at that point I was going to die. Yeah. Well, a lot of those things, I mean, this was, a, was this in like in the early 2000s? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that was. It cool. was about maybe 10 or 11 years ago. So yeah, the early 2000s. Yeah, that was the the glory years of uh, Chinese like gray yeah. market research chemical companies where you could just order all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, and yeah, it, and like, uh, and yeah, I mean, and a I said, lot of the, those. The only reason these things weren't le- legal yet is because they've yeah. just been made and there wasn't any laws governing. You know exactly. I mean, a lot of this stuff. Uh, there were some analog laws that were passed in the U.S. around then that kind of clamped down on some of it. But the fact was, I mean, if you look at like uh, like PiCal, there are hundreds of different phenylalanines and like other sort of chemicals that you can uh, put together in various combinations. And they, they can be dangerous because a lot of times the LD50 ratings for those things aren't even known, right? So like in like the... Yeah, you have no of, idea what a proper dosage is, what a safe yeah. dosage is. And as I said, I... I smoked uh, a wee bit, and because it never worked right away, I was like, ha, this must be a load of rubbish. I'm just going to smoke all of it. <laughs> Which, in hindsight, really wasn't the best thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that, and yeah, I've definitely been there, like, in the sort of summer of, like, 2007, 2008. Um, people I knew had gotten their hands on a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, and specifically, I think it was 2,5-dimethoxy-4-chloroamphetamine. But it was, like, kind of a mescaline analog. And I remember we were all like hanging out and, you know, taking it and dosing. And I was always like super careful because, you know, I've always like done psychedelics and I'm pretty careful. If I don't know how something's going to affect me, I would rather low dose and not get much than accidentally take too much. And you're a sensible person. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we were, there was a guy there who was like ex-special forces and and he, you know, he took some, uh, it was on like blotter and he was like, oh, I don't feel anything. I'm just going to take some more. And he ate like an entire sheet. <laughs> <laughs> and by the end of the night, this guy was like, I mean, he was just sitting there staring ahead. But when he like finally came to the next day, he told us that he was like on the top of a pyramid in Babylon. And he was like <laughs> witnessing like the fall of the universe or something. Wow. And wow. It, it, like he completely went like completely straight after that experience too. became like a born again Christian and never touched alcohol or drugs or anything ever again. Ah. Yeah. Huh. And, and a lot of those things, I mean, the thing about your heart, I can definitely see, because a lot of these are, like, have amphetamine as a component or, yeah. or act similarly. Yeah, and they can just cause you to get yeah, I feel really like my heart bad. Yeah, I was going to burst out my chest, you know. I, yeah. I, was ter- I started, I got, like, the cold sweats, like, this all the symptoms of a heart attack, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Sitting there, like, I'm, I honestly thought, this is it. This is how my story ends. 20 <laughs> years old, drug overdose. <laughs> yeah i definitely know that feeling too of where you feel like an alien in your own sort of environment right yeah. like things just simply don't make sense you're like what where am i like what are you like you know you look at your legs and you're like i don't know what these things are or how they work if you want me to continue a little bit after i, re- I thought i was going to die i went downstairs you know and <clears throat> to be with my family mm-hmm. i wasn't going to die alone and as i said <laughs> like if my sister walked into the room I think that's my sister. I know who she is. The minute she walked out the room again, it's like, what sister? I don't have a sister, you know? It was mm-hmm. really, really weird. Mm-hmm. And I, I was getting panicky. I was like, because I, I knew in some level that I wasn't remembering everything. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was like, you need to stay with me. You can't leave my sight. Everybody needs to stay with me. I, you can't leave my sight. You know, I was physically grabbing hold of my sister and going, don't leave me. Don't leave me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I says, right, maybe if I can draw a picture, I'll remember better. So says, right, give me a sheet of paper and a pen and I'll draw a picture of you. So my sister's sort of sitting and I'm sort of drawing her like one of my French girls, you know. Putting, <laughs> sort of putting a lot of, it took me, a, you know, it wasn't just a quick scribble, it was like a good sort of 15, 20 minutes sitting, trying to get every detail right, you know, putting a lot of concentration in it. So eventually I finished my drawing and my sister's like, you're right, can I see your drawing? I hand her the piece of paper. And honest, it wasn't, you couldn't even say it was a stick person, it was just like a big scribble. There was no mm-hmm. coherence to it at all. There was no, as I said, it wasn't even like, oh, I can see the rough outline of a person there. No, it was as if I just took the pen and went. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So, <laughs> well, suffice to say, I never tried that stuff again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that that sense of alienness is, um, in a way, because you see, you have that same sort of experience when you have like out of body experiences or near death experiences. I think, I think what's happening is you get this realization when you're on psychedelics or you're having these sort of paranormal experiences that you are not really who you think you are. You know, we all think that we are our physical body, you know, the, the ego. We all think that we are, you know, this person that has been born and has all these memories and this personality and identity. When in reality, it's, it, that's just a cloak. That's just yeah. what you're wearing right now. The way, when, sorry, the way oh, I... Go ahead. Uh, the way I sort of see it, just what you mm -hmm. were talking about there, it's mm -hmm. almost as if humans are a B and a two parts. Like, we've got this mm -hmm. third dimensional physical aspect, mm -hmm. and we've got this other higher dimensional aspect, that, mm -hmm. and we're sort of both parts at once, but we don't mm -hmm. really realize it or something. Yeah, I think we... Like, it's explained... Um, I've, been, I've been reading the Book of the Law lately, and Crowley goes into this a bit, in the line, uh, the cobs is in the coup, and not the coup in the cobs. And what that sort of means is that we sort of, we are higher entities, but we wear these shells because they allow us to individuate, right? They allow us to have our own individuality, our own personalities and experiences. Um, because yeah. if, we, if we didn't, we wouldn't have personalities or experiences or anything. Something mm -hmm. I've heard said before, it's almost like, we're these higher dimensional entities, and in mm. order to experience and interact with the third dimensional realm, it's mm. like you put on this body almost like you would put on a diving suit to go underwater, mm. or a mm. space suit to go into space, you know? Mm. It's like we don these physical bodies, and so we can experience the limitations of third dimensional existence, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Robert Monroe, I mean, explicitly says that, and that's, that's why entities or whatever our souls are incarnate on earth is because it, it's like a, a learning experience mm -hmm. you know because where they come from there isn't such a thing as time and the passage of time and change yeah. and evolution i mean i think even grant morrison talked about that when he had his you know abduction experience in Kathmandu, when he was shown what the universe actually was it, it was a place where things can grow because whatever the higher dimensions are like there isn't such a thing as time Right, so yeah, everything is static. Everything stays the same. That's really forever. interesting. Again, going mm -hmm. back to my psychedelic stuff and that, mm -hmm. I keep getting, I keep mentioning the word timeless. Like mm -hmm. I've been there forever. I've never mm -hmm. left the place. When I was having mm -hmm. these psychedelic experiences, that's how it felt. Like this yeah. is me. I've always been here. I always will be here. There's no concept of time. Mm -hmm. it's, again, it's a really hard thing to put into words, but that's that's mm -hmm. what I felt. You know. Yeah, and, and that realization can really uh, bother some people. I, I know my, my little brother recently has been having a really hard time dealing with this uh, psychedelic experience he had, where he had a similar experience of timelessness, in that, you know, during this experience, he felt all of his, like, all of his memories uh, fading away, and, like, you know, until he couldn't, until he was no longer himself, and then he felt time completely disappear, until there was no more time and he felt like he was there forever. And in, in some ways I, I tend to think about that and maybe he yeah. is still there, you know, <laughs> like it, maybe it is it's sort of an infinite place that he's now in or experiencing, even though time in the physical world has resumed and, you know, he's, yeah. he's living his life now that can be very hard for people to under understand or even put yeah, into words if you've, if you've experienced it, right? Because it's almost impossible to describe to someone. Well, uh, well it's like a lot of people say about out-of-body experiences and stuff. You see mm -hmm. things and you get this knowledge and mm -hmm. you get back to our reality and you mm -hmm. just get no frame of reference to even start talking about it. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. such a completely different place, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so many things in that out-of-body state in particular, because that's that's what I've, I've had experiences with. It, it, so much of it's told to you or you're, you're put through these different experiences uh, that are seem to be largely symbolic and it's almost like something's trying to teach you a, a lesson or, or teach you something like mm -hmm. i've had a lot of experiences where i've had to fight things um in the out-of-body experience but then um as that sort of narrative progressed um i started noticing things were like scared of me and i started feeling guilty almost like am i a monster out here you know are these 
I don't want these things to be scared of me uh, necessarily. And I, I had this experience where I came up against something that I knew I couldn't fight because that I was, it was sort of almost like a trial. Like I had to show mm -hmm. compassion in order to move forward through the experience. And it, it's, it's wild because it's almost like a halfway state between that sort of psychedelic ego death, right? Because yeah. the whole psychedelic ego death thing is like completely unknowable. It's like completely impossible to describe. Yeah. But in out of body experiences, you're, you're sort of in a halfway point where you've got mm -hmm. one foot still in sort of material reality and symbology, but then sort of another foot in this unknowable like expanse. Yeah. Yeah, I saw an liminal sort of space between the two. Where yeah, exactly. Yeah, a liminal both space. Both can sort of connect. Mm -hmm. Where it's like it's it's possible for you to experience things outside of yourself, but still um, like synthesize that with your material existence. Now, now, Ren, your experience where you had the the sort of uh, fractal creature in the uh, mm -hmm. in the woods was similar. Yeah, th I really didn't think about that. Um, now yeah, that was that was before you did any psychedelics as well, right? Oh yeah, I was a kid. Yeah, I was a little kid. Um, I don't know if you ever heard me describe that, David, but I've heard, I have heard it before, but I wouldn't mind being told again in person. <laughs> okay. Well, basically, I was just I was hiking through the woods with my little brother and my dad um, in, in North Alabama, and I got ahead of them because um, mm -hmm. I like to imagine that like I was some kind of scout or something, and I was scouting ahead. And I came around this bend. Um, I got spooked by these two big like turkey vultures that uh, I guess I walked up on them feeding on something. They flew over me and, and scared me. But it, then as I'm like recovering from getting startled by these birds, I start hearing this like metallic clanking noise like coming from down inside the hollow. Uh, I was like sort of on a on a path that winded around a big uh, mountain. So I kind of looked down into this hollow. And I look down in there and I see this thing that looks like it has like four legs. Like it, it reminded me of like a tiger, like a cat or something like running. Um, but the weird thing was, was it looked like it was made up of like black and white triangles and stripes and like almost well, like a... Wait, sorry to cut you off. So, oh, no, I just, I might have seen something similar in a sort of dream or something. So you, are you saying that it's mostly its body was sort of fractal and weird, but you could still make out the sort of the four limbs? Yeah, I could still sort of make out um, like the general shape of the thing, mm -hmm. but it was almost like a, like going back to the, the game thing. It was almost like a really low poly like animal, you know, like from yeah. a, like a like a PS1 game or something like it was like it. I could tell the shape um, it was sort of similar to like a cat, a big cat or something. But it, its body was made up of these like large triangles and, and, and fractals. It wasn't like a perfect like kind of polygonal thing. It was still mm -hmm. sort of chaotic. Um, but I just remember, you know, it just being so completely strange and I, I didn't really take much time to look at it. This yeah. part of me, which is I, I'd taken a closer look, but it's, it scared me so badly that I immediately just started running back yeah. you know, to where my, my dad and my little brother are, you know, I didn't, I didn't stick around too long to figure out what it was or what it was doing there. Yeah, but I have a, uh, I don't know if this is like a full astral projection sort of thing or if it is just mm -hmm. a dream because... Like I said, it's sort of hard to tell, but I had a series of dreams sort of, maybe a few years back, probably just after the sort of stuff with the phone and the weird sort of rune stuff happened. Mm -hmm. And the, the dreams sort of happened one week after the other, and I felt like the three dreams were connected. And in the first dream, I saw something similar like that. I saw these entities, right? And what they looked like they depended on how far away they were from me. Mm -hmm. So when they were a fair distance away, you ever seen like seen Tom and Jerry, like when Tom and Jerry are fighting? It's mm -hmm. the animator draws it like this big sort of cloud of swirling sort of smoke. And every mm -hmm. so often you see like a hand and arm and a leg sort mm -hmm. of flying out the smoke. That's mm -hmm. what these things look like. It was just like this swirling blob of sort of black and grey sort of chaos. And mm -hmm. every so often you'd see like an arm and a leg sort of appear out the cloud and But as they got closer, Amy, to sort of within like four or five feet. They would mm -hmm. change into like basically a normal humanoid. Mm -hmm. the, the way they looked to me was they were wearing sort of black cloaks, and they they looked like normal people, but their their skin was quite sort of pale and sickly looking. Mm -hmm. But when that when, and if that was if they were standing right next to me, that's what they would look like. And if mm -hmm. I were to walk away again, they would sort of 
once I got, imagine it like a circle, like a radius around me, mm-hmm. like a, fi- a five foot radius. Mm-hmm. If I sort of stepped away so they were outside that radius, they would sort of turn back into the, just the sort of chaotic form again. Mm. Which I, th- I thought was really, oh, when I mean, you hear like the co-creation sort of stuff and that, and yeah, yeah. it's almost like they only took a form once they were close to me, and as I got further away, they sort of lost their form, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they just needed to take some sort of form when you were close by that you would understand. Yeah. That sort of reminds me of another Ritzman thing where he talks about that that man with the cloak that had like that was made of static. Right. And it was yeah. just, and that well the cloak was also he said when he felt it the same material that he was covered with as a kid. Mhm. Which just makes it that much weirder. Yeah. And you have a lot of weird stories too of uh entities like greys and stuff appearing wearing cloaks, which I've always yeah. uh, thought was well, kind of strange. Well actually my my sister's story is actually like that. Oh, so what? What did she see? Well, do you, uh, do you want me to so, read hers? I think that would be better because I would I would be telling the story from my own sort of memory of what she said, so it'd be a second hand okay. account, you know. Whereas you can read what she actually posted. Okay. Um. <clears throat> and how is her na- name pronounced? It's pronounced Barry. Okay. Um. It's she said, says, "What?" Oh, I was just going to say it's Gaelic. Ah. Okay. Um, and that's, that's why I was asking you about your name to make sure that your last name was what it yeah, looked like. Yeah, it, it confuses <laughs> a lot of people because it's spelled like M-H-A-I-R-I. And people right. It's like Bahari or something, but it's yep. pronounced, pronounced like Vari. Hmm. Okay, so she says, when I was around seven years old, I had a best friend named Robert. He lived in the house directly across from me, and we grew up together and were very close. As a child, I was very mischievous, and I always broke rules and wouldn't do what I was told. It was a nice day out, so me and Robert decided to have a picnic in the woods that are basically down the street from my house, but obviously I wasn't allowed to go down there without an adult as I was only seven years old. But I didn't listen or care, and I didn't think anything would happen to me as we live in a small village and everyone knows everyone, so I felt pretty safe. We packed some food into a bag, headed down the street to the woods. We walked down a steep hill that led to the old to an old wooden broken bridge that we used to call the Cowboy Bridge at the time. And the council had blocked off the bridge with metal fencing as it was too dangerous. It was later replaced with a new, more modern bridge. The wooden railings had rotted away and were in the water below and there were planks of wood missing. But us being silly kids, we didn't think about the danger and just wanted to go over that bridge because that's where we wanted to picnic. But then we looked in front of us and and I can only describe it as a thing in a black robe and its face looked like a mask in scream with big black eyes, pale face, no nose, etc. And it was abnormally tall and skinny. It just stood there in front of us for a while, staring at us completely still. And me and Robert were frozen in fear until it pulled out what looked like a knife and started to charge at us without warning. We ran and never looked back and never told anyone about it because we thought no one would ever believe us as we were just silly kids and we didn't want to get in trouble for being there alone. We decided to go back the next day and see if we could see it again. I see something, and then Robert shouted and pointed at the top of one of the trees. There it was, the very top of the tree, staring right at us, but, I'm, but also trying to hide at the same time as not to get noticed. As soon as it, as soon as it did realize we noticed it, I liter- it literally jumped off the tree from the very top to the bottom and disappeared into the dense forest. We then knew we weren't crazy. I never told anyone this story until I was around 16 years old, and the first person I told was, well, you, David. And you said it was, uh, it sounds like the description of the gray. Yeah, well, see, at the time when she was a kid, she she said she saw somebody in a scream mask. Because at at that time, see, the the scream movies were big. So, I mean, if if you're a kid and you're not really into ufology and that, but you know he's scream, and you see someone with like a white face and big black eyes, see the resemblance you know yeah oh yeah yeah that's what i immediately thought was scream when she was talking about like the black cloak and everything yeah and the fact that he pulled out a knife though definitely lends to the scream thing but that could also be a co-creation thing they encountered something (laughs) yeah and gave it some form and jumping off the tree is is strikes me the thing with the broken bridge and that it's, it's like mothman in miniature you know it's this little rickety wooden bridge going across this river and there's two kids that are away from their parents and they're really not supposed to be in the woods themselves. They're going to go over mm-hmm. this dangerous bridge and something scares them away for their own good, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although, although I'm kind of surprised they went back the next day. Yeah, well, morbid curiosity, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very brave, yeah. That, that was horrifying. We almost died. Let's go back and see if it's still there. <laughs> Well, she has Scottish. <laughs> we'll have to, we'll to follow up with uh, with Cutchin on this too, because I'm curious if there's any like like fairy stuff that he knows that has to do with bridges. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there is. So. Oh yeah, I'll actually need to ask her again. But I was sure there was bagpipes involved in that story somewhere. Like she saw it and she thought it had bagpipes at one point. Hmm. But she thought I, I thought that especially weird, especially with like Joshua's stuff. I mm-hmm. need to ask her again. Maybe that's something I've again. I'm going to be like. A second time account, you know. Mm-hmm. I need to ask mm-hmm. her myself, but was that the only experience she had that was like that? Well, she said a variety of exper- experiences. Probably just... just as much as I have. Oh, really? Yeah. What about the rest of your family? Yeah, the f- most of us have. My dad's quite skeptical, but even he's saw things, and he's not as so quick to sort of believe it's something else. But he acknowledges, yeah, there's something weird going on. Hmm. I do think these things tend to run in families. I think that's something that's been observed before in abduction I, I don't cases know, as well. I don't know if it's just our family or if it's geographical, because mm-hmm. I know like the next door neighbor, they had a lot of ghost stuff and some pretty extreme poltergeist sort of stuff mm-hmm. just in the house mm-hmm. next door, you know. And in fact, there was a time here somebody made up. A, you ever seen Twin Peaks? Yeah, yeah. Sign, uh, welcome to Twin Peaks and put it outside our village, huh. which is awesome. <laughs> it, but it was only up for like a week before the council took it down again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe our village has got a bit of a reputation for being a bit strange, you know? Yeah, I mean, it could be like sort of like a window area that Keel talks about. It makes me think like, so my, both myself and my little brother have a lot of out-of-body experiences. And I think my, my dad has never really talked much about it, but he's told he's you know your parents let things slip you know sometimes and I, I think he's probably had his experiences as well and um i'll never forget my mom one time i was we were watching some uh it was like a made for tv movie about alien abductions it might have been the intruders movie i think there was a movie based on intruders that, that bud hopkins book yeah there was a uh, miniseries actually I, yeah it was I, the miniseries yep yeah. That's another book. It's sitting in my cupboard, buried because I'm too scared to read it. <laughs> God, that that book is terrifying. And I remember us watching that. And at one point, my mom just like looks at me and completely deadpan says, "You know that really happens to some people." Oof. With like this wistful look in her face, I'm like, "You really don't need to tell me that." Because, I mean, I, I I was terrified as a kid of like abductions and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I've gotten better over time. Mm-hmm. But even up until like just four or five years ago, I'm just terrified. And even now, when I start thinking about and talking about Grays, I get the wee shivers going up my spine and that, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah. oh, there's, there's something I, really creepy. I still, I, I mean, I've never seen a Grey, but I still like, I, I close my door when I go to bed at night to my bedroom. And like, I sometimes just, you know, look off into the darkness as I'm going to sleep and like halfway expect to see something standing there, yeah. and, you know. Well, see, talking about, like, astral projecting and that again, that's, mm-hmm. the amount of times, or even just, like, I do meditation work in that sometimes, mm-hmm. and the amount of times I've self-sabotaged myself, you know, it's like, they don't mm-hmm. think of pink elephants thing, it's like, all right, I'm going to get here, I'm going to meditate, I'm going to get into this state, but whatever I do, don't think he grays. <laughs> oh, no! No! <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I, had that, I had that happen to me one time, um, pretty recently, I was, I was going into sleep paralysis, and... Um, I started thinking to myself, I really hope I don't see a gray. And then <laughs> yeah, I started to see probably. like, you know, this, this sort of shape start, uh, you know, manifesting in yeah. my room. And I was like, but I, luckily I was able to like calm myself down and think, okay, you're making yourself see this. There's, there's nothing really there. And then it went away. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it didn't, then I'd really be in trouble. Now, David, have you seen Greys any other time than that early experience that you're aware of? Sort of, yes. I posted your story like that. It was another one of my sort of lucid dreaming slash astral whatever sort of things. So one night, I was working in a warehouse at this time. I only worked in the warehouse for a couple of months. It was just a temporary job, you know. So I'd fallen asleep and I was lying in bed and I knew, you know, sometimes you just get a feeling. I knew I was going to become lucid. 
just mm-hmm. with how I felt, you know, the way I was sort of slipping off to sleep. And sure enough, when I started to dream, I was lucid and I found myself in the warehouse that I worked. The only difference is it was completely empty. That's why I'm not sure if it was like an OBE, because everyone looked exactly the same. But there was no people there, which is weird because it's a 24-hour operation. Mm-hmm. So you would think there would be like the night shift workers there. But So I'm in this warehouse and I'm completely alone. And there was a bit in the warehouse where, just sort of where the workers come in, there was a row of a couple of drinking fountains and there's a mirror. And I don't know if you've heard this, trend, but when I've read stuff online about how to lucid dreaming, that one thing I hear repeated is, don't look in mirrors. Hmm. Because I don't know if you've ever heard that before. I've, I I think I've heard that, but I don't remember ever coming across a mirror to have to worry about that. Um, what well, is the what is the reason they say not to look in the mirror? They don't really say. Oh, huh, okay. <laughs> I mean, so, it's kind of interesting because Michael, I think Michael Raduca, when he talks about um, sort of his method of inducing out-of-body experiences and how to like do out-of-body experiences, he actually, actually encourages people, like, when you go out of body, go look mirror. at yourself in a mirror. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, but the, the point I make is I had a negative sort of thing in my mind about looking in mirrors because mm-hmm. I'd heard it before. So I don't know if because I was expecting to see something bad, I saw something bad. Mm-hmm. And that sort of coloured my experience that way. Whereas if I was like yourself and I never heard it before, I might have mm-hmm. just seen my reflection. But back to the point, I'd heard that uh, looking in mirrors was a bad idea. So just like my sister going back down to the woods, I was like, I'm going to look in this mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just... You know, let, let, let's just do it. So I walk over to the mirror and I'm standing and I gradually saw my reflection morph into a grey and it was looking back at me through this mirror and that just, seeing my reflection turn into a grey, that just mm-hmm. totally, totally scared me to the bone. I mean, mm-hmm. and I was going, my, there was all these sort of things going through my head like, what if I'm a grey or something, you know, and <laughs> the, thought, yeah. the thought of that, oh Jesus, just, oh no. And just all these thoughts going through my head, that really, that terrified me for a while after seeing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, so- I, can't, I can't really say that uh, that's like seeing a legit grey because I'm pretty sure I probably just made that up in my own head or something. I was mm-hmm. expecting to see something scary and lo and behold, I saw the thing I'm most scared of. Sort of like, if you've ever like, read Harry Potter, there's the bog that takes mm-hmm. the form of your worst fear. Mm-hmm. It's maybe something like yeah. that, I don't know, but it, it scared me nonetheless. <laughs> I think a lot about that, about when people see things that, that scare them in that sense, um, it, how much of that is based on their expectations? Like, yeah. to, to go back sort of the psychedelic thing, um, if you ever want to have a good time, go to, to Arrowhead and uh, check out the uh, Benadryl or Diphenhydramine experience vault. Because mm-hmm. not a lot of people realize that if you take too much Benadryl um, and it's less... Off medicine Benadryl? Yeah, that- it's like an antihistamine. Yeah, it'll you'll have a bad time to say the <laughs> least. Um, you'll have extremely vivid like hallucinations, and not in the sort of like psychedelic, like oh everything's like colorful sense, but mm. in like you will see people and things that aren't really there, like almost like you're having like a schizophrenic episode or something. <laughs> and um, a lot of people report seeing spiders specifically, like and. Having been um, an extremely dumb teenager, I also, I, I did that, and <laughs> I also saw giant spiders everywhere. And That's it, funny, because I have a friend, and I don't mm-hmm. know if it was Benadryl he took, but he mm-hmm. has a, a psychedelic experience where he saw spiders. Yeah, it's, it's odd. Uh, I mean, because on some level, I thought to myself during it, I wonder if I'm seeing this because that's what I expected to see, because I'd read the other people talking about yeah. seeing Right. If I'd never read that, would this yeah, be exactly. what I was seeing? But on another occasion, I sort of understood on some level why I was seeing a spider because what it actually was was uh, I was in a car behind the person driving. They were like a they were a girl, so they had long hair, and she had this like stray hair that was waving around, and that stray hair became like you know this this big spider leg, yeah. mm. and I was realizing during the experience okay, what's happening is my mind is associating this thing with, uh, you know, something living because it sees it moving. And it's, but but then again, too, I don't know. Would I, if I'd never read those experiences, would I have seen the same things? Or, yeah. yeah. Maybe you'd have seen a snake or something instead of a spider. 
Yeah, and you do see in, in psychedelics, though, especially like ayahuasca, you do see repeated themes to what people experience. Oh, yeah, even... I've heard like people that have took ayahuasca, they see like mm-hmm. jaguars and stuff. Yeah, even jungles. They get, like Paris, they're not even in the jungle, but they get all this jungle visionary. Yeah, yeah, they get like jungle imagery for a seemingly no real reason. Even people who weren't expecting to see that get that same kind of. Yeah. And, you know, that. Some people would say the reason is because the, the plant itself is communicating with the person. Yeah. Right? It's like that's, the spirit of the plant. Isn't that what the, the tribes say? Like, when you ask them where did they get ayahuasca from, it's like, oh, the plants told us how to make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the plant told us how to make it, yeah. Hmm. Well, we're almost out of time. Do um, you guys want to continue this on a Patreon segment for a few minutes? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Sure. Okay. All right. Um. And obviously, if anyone's had experiences like David's, you know, let let us know because the more we can kind of put these things together, the better. Um, if everyone's had anyone's, especially the fractal experiences with the doppelganger and stuff like that, I mean, those are very very strange. Um, but obviously, there's some precedent out there. As Ren had something similar with the the thing in the woods. So. Contact us, contact at wheredtheroadgo.com if you want to talk about stuff that's happened to you, stories at wheredtheroadgo.com. And Ren, people can find you where? Uh, they can go to liminalroom.com or they can find me on Twitter at, uh, at Mr. M-I-S-T-E-R underscore APOL, A-P-O-L. All right, awesome. Where Did the Road Go wouldn't be what it is without the support of our Patreons. In particular, those pledging $10 or more a month, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, UFO Weekly News, Tim, Andy McNamara, Lindsay Jackson K, Charles R. Beauregard, Jennifer Campbell, Craig Cicernos, Eric Citron, Jose A, Kevin, Scott Morris Everett, Sean Cosgrove, Robert Groom, Roland Belstadt, Janet Runyon, Riker and Stark, John Rutledge Foster III, Christopher Vaughn, Mike McGuire, Ben Crow, American Rambler, Carla Mahoney, John Eddy, Chris, Mark Brady, Nate Syria, William Lovelace, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Kevin Shrek, Paul Buscini, and Alfred Tuttle. Thank you all so much. Again, I want to thank Dave for coming forth and actually talking to us. Um, if you missed, he uh, he actually sent me his initial email about two years ago, and it kind of got just got lost in the mix, as well as a bunch of others, um, as things got busier and busier. And so when I when I treated these in the uh, when we just discussed them, uh, he initially didn't want to come on, but uh, finally acquiesced and came on and talked to us. And I'm really glad he did. That was a very fun conversation for us. I hope everyone else out there enjoyed it. And there is a little bit longer on the Patreon. I don't remember exactly how long it is, but uh, just talking about some more of his experiences and stuff. And as I said, if you have an experience and you want to share it, we can either just discuss it or you can come on the show and talk about it. Uh, it's stories at where did the road go dot com. That is the very best place to send it because then they're all in one place. And we do have a Reddit and the Reddit forum where you can see his drawings of the rune and stuff that he was talking about is where did the road go so it's where it's reddit.com slash r slash where did the road go i believe is how that works and hopefully we can get uh that up and running a little bit better and make it a nice forum type situation so go check that out that's r-e-d-d-i-t for anyone who doesn't know there will be a link on the website eventually i haven't gotten around to putting it up there yet next week should see the return of Steph Young to the show, if all goes well. I know a lot of people have been asking when she's going to be back. Well, I can answer you now, hopefully next week. Um, Yeah, and I got some other very interesting stuff coming up in the weeks to come. Some very interesting conversations, I hope. All right, and I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this ex-